Okay. Joining. Okay. All right, I think we'll start, seeing as there's so many people here already. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Biodiversity Network um, sem seminar. This morning, we're really lucky to have um, Alex Rashlong with us. Um, Alex has a background in conservation science, and he also holds three years of management and editorial experience in academic publishing. He's currently based at the Nature Based Solutions Initiative here with Natalie Seddon at Oxford University. And he manages the knowledge exchange projects and conduct applied research for evidence-based policy on nature-based solutions with a fo focus on climate change adaptation, development, and the role of nature-based solutions in economic recoveries. Through his work with IID, which he'll be talking about, he's also exploring how to strengthen multi-stakeholder transdisciplinary collaborations, tackling environment and development challenges. Um, guys, I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat as we go along. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for you to either put something in the chat and I can read it out, or you can come online and pose your question directly to Alex. So um, Alex, over to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much, Carlin. And um, thank you to Cecile and the Biodiversity Network for giving me the chance to, to present. I hope everybody can, can hear me clear and I hope everyone is, is staying safe. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing your, your reflections on, on what I'll discuss today. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about capacities for transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary working. And I will get into those, what those terms mean. Um, and I will use the Sentinel project as a case study um, and Sentinel is uh, an international research partnership led by uh, IIED involving the partner organizations that you see at the bottom of the screen. And I'll also walk you through the process that we embarked on uh, for capacity strengthening in the project uh, and capturing learning lessons. And if any, anything is unclear, uh, please take note of it so that we can discuss it afterwards. So let me see if I can switch. There we go. So the aim of Sentinel is to produce research on impacts, risks, and trade-offs between the, the social, the economic, and the environmental dimensions of agricultural development pathways to inform policy in three countries, uh, Ghana, Zambia, and Ethiopia. And the core project team is, is diverse. Um, it's, it's, it's led by IID, as I mentioned, but it involves both academic uh, and development organizations uh, across the four countries, uh, the UK, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Zambia. And when I say the research team, I, I think it's important to, to clarify that I am not purely speaking about researchers, but rather the, the team as a whole that, that enables the process uh, to, uh, the, 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 that enables the research process. So there's the management and coordination partners, communication partners, as well as monitoring, evaluation, and learning officers in the team. And the challenges that Sentinel is trying to, to address in policy in those uh, three sub-Saharan countries around social and environmental trade-offs in agricultural development pathways are related to these, these wicked problems that we hear about, which are problems that implicate multiple disciplines and sectors. And as the graphic on the right shows, these, these are problems that are, that are interlinked. So, so approaches are, 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 are needed uh, to bridge disciplines and sectors and uh, different ways of knowing, including knowledge held by non-academic stakeholders. And this has been understood for a while across some sectors, um, but overall, I think uh, this way of working is, is, is underapplied or underappreciated. And <clears throat> the notion or the idea of bringing different groups of cultures, different groups and cultures and perspectives 
uh, to produce innovation and solutions um, isn't, you know, purely an issue in the academic realm or in sustainability science. It was evoked by by Steve Jobs um, in a presentation he did a while ago, and and he emphasized how this 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 crossover in this case between technology and the liberal arts and the humanities uh, really sits at the core of the the Apple philosophy and explains the success of the company. Um, so to deliver on this promise of, of uh, you know, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, uh, Sentinel has, has an overarching focus on, on capacity strengthening. Um, and more specifically, what we focus on are capacity strengthening at the individual and research team levels. What I mean by that is, is the capacity of the research team to, to provide an effective working environment which contributes to the capacity of individuals uh, within their team to perform their functions and achieve their objectives. And my focus here is to report on, on the learning experience from the project. Uh, I will also give an overview of the peer-reviewed literature uh, and uh, on how to operate and strengthen uh, capacities and in diverse international research partnerships. And this, this understanding this process is is quite important to, to promote the, you know, the, to, to fulfill the, the, their mission, so to speak. So I'll talk about two terms here, uh, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, but I want to, I think it's important to take a step back and, and clarify what these different terms mean. And um, even though they're sometimes used uh, interchangeably, uh, they mean different things. So. To start with, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary means different disciplines working in parallel without integration, like this Rubik's cube on the left, uh, where the small cubes represent uh, individual disciplines that stay separate. Interdisciplinarity is generally understood as different disciplines uh, crossing disciplinary boundaries to create new knowledge and theory, uh, sort of like if those cubes melted together. Uh, and transdisciplinarity, and there are different interpretations of the term, but one of the dominant ones is that it reflects the integration of multiple knowledge systems beyond academic knowledge, like knowledge held by research users, and this can be policymakers, uh, local community and indigenous peoples or, or practitioners, for instance. Um, and so, yeah, in this, in this, this picture on the right, the, 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 the bracelet, uh, strings represent different knowledge systems, if you will, and, and it, transdisciplinarity is about uh, weaving these together. And so this is a process that is very much about producing science with uh, society. And, um, and it, does, it does share attributes with other approaches like citizen science. And the similarity between inter and transdisciplinarity is that they both involve uh, close iterative working, investigating a shared problem or question. They both focus on, on, on knowledge integration. Um, okay, so I'll leave it at that for now. So, so Sentinel is a transdisciplinary partnership, I would say, in that it seeks to bridge knowledge across disciplines and bring together academics um, and research users to produce actionable outputs for uh, impact in, in, in agricultural and development policy. And the, 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 the right-hand figure shows the, the research users, uh, broadly speaking, that, that in 2018, we mapped out for the project. So basically the objective here is to identify who the project should work with, uh, who are the relevant stakeholders. Um, in both, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, a crucial, crucial process is, is co-production. Now, co-production has different meanings and it's used in different ways by different communities of practice uh, and research. And, but in sustainability science, the process basically recognizes that the relationships and interactions between researchers and stakeholders um, uh, are uh, uh, key to achieving the impact of research. Um, it is a normative principle. 
Uh, but it's it's it, yeah, it's generally accepted that that knowledge for environmental management should be co-produced, um, although it's often not the case. Co-production goes beyond identifying problems to assessing them. Um, so it, go, it goes beyond identification and assessment to, uh, to the deployment of solutions. And then this is where, you know, the research and, and society really come together. Uh, because these approaches are multifaceted and complex, it's really tough to know what works and why. So Sentinel is, is an opportunity to, to look more closely at this process. Um, so in Sentinel, we, we harness tools and methods a variety of tools and methods as a part of a, an, an integrated approach, I would say, to, to building capacities and learning from the, the experience. Um, and we started with uh, an initial round of, of uh, semi-structured interviews in, in, in early 2019, about a year after the project started. Um, and from that, we developed a, a needs assessment. Um, and we developed the capacity strengthening strategies and we held workshops, uh, training workshops and webinars, um, some of whom were done by the communication partners, others by the researchers. Uh, and, and what this allowed us to do is to also reflect on emerging challenges, opportunities, uh, and to capture the, the, the participant uh, the participants' experiences as the project progressed. And a key aspect of that are, were these interviews I uh, I conducted. Um, so I did several rounds of interviews throughout the course of the project. Um, in total, uh, there were about 90 hours of discussion. Uh, that does not include a lot of other discussions. I, 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 I held in more informal types of, of discussions. Uh, these interviews were framed around experiences of working across disciplines, participant interactions and relationships, uh, the influence of the structure of the project, uh, and also to some extent, uh, the organizational, the institutional and organizational contexts that researchers and other project partners sat in. Um, and right now, what I'm focusing on is an analysis that looks at uh, challenges and successes. Uh, so yeah, constraints and enablers um, to interdisciplinary working, uh, research, researcher collaborations, including uh, uh, UK Africa collaborations and the factors that mediate these processes. Uh, and next Monday we're doing, uh, I'm running an internal uh, learning session workshop with the team to give the partners an opportunity to reflect on these findings and validate them. And the idea is that we're gonna uh, hopefully <laughs> co-create uh, guidance for funders and, and, and researchers and, and, and others uh, engaged in these types of uh, international research partnerships. So the lessons I'll talk to you about today draw on these interviews um, and a review of the literature. And I realize I'm probably uh, talking too much, so I'll speed up a bit. But we also, I also did a, a review of the literature. I won't go into that, but that was to, um, yeah, to to expand the, the the scope, if you will, beyond Sentinels as case study. Um, so <laughs> this picture is just to to say that that interdisciplinary working is full of opportunities and it has a high potential of innovation, but it's also messy, complex, and full of challenges and. These are just some of the, the overarching themes uh, in my interviews, specifically with respect to uh, challenges and constraints in interdisciplinary working. I'll go into these in a bit, uh, but there are a lot of challenges associated with communication, project design and structure and research integration and team building and governing or operating these projects. And, um, and these challenges are, 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 are intersecting. So to start with, I'll, I'll give you an overview of some, some key uh, challenges. Um, so first, there, there's the lack of, of, of proactive engagement. Um, proactive communication is, is absolutely essential to develop a shared understanding of the work, roles and responsibilities and make potential uh, misunderstandings more visible. Um, and time constraints, uh, can really limit researchers' ability to, to engage actively with others, uh, which challenges research integration. Um, 
And it's also key to, to have this proactive engagement to enable processes like stakeholder engagement and to work with communication partners. Um, then uh, another challenge that, that we observed is, is uh, the lack of explicit delineation of roles and responsibilities. So, so clarifying roles and responsibilities in large complex projects, which involve multiple teams across different organizations, uh, is more challenging than it may sound, but it's absolutely essential. Um, yeah, it's, it's really key for effective decision making and to ensure that things don't get left behind. Uh, when roles aren't clear, there can be an issue with no one taking ownership for a particular output. And, and even if efforts are made to write those roles down on paper, um, there can be you know, different interpretations. Um, so it's important to have discussions about this. Misaligned perspective interests or priorities as well. So that's largely because projects like Sentinel encompass a diversity of partners from different disciplines, cultures, organizations and uh, interests and priorities rarely align. And as I'll discuss, this is in part because of different incentive structures um, that people work under. Then balancing different ways of working, uh, which is related to these differences. Um, so for instance, partner and development organizations might focus on ways of working that promote research user engagement, uh, talking to policymakers, for instance, or they might focus on capacity strengthening, whereas academics, academics will first and foremost focus on delivering research, uh, peer-reviewed research, and often according to certain disciplinary norms. Uh, so there is a mismatch there, if you will, um, at least in terms of what the priorities are. Um, a, a, a challenging issue is to determine when and how much collaboration is needed in these projects. Um, what is the extent of cross-disciplinary interaction that is actually needed? Uh, what is the balance between a formal meetings for procedure where you involve everyone to plan things out methodically versus more informal, perhaps smaller research exploration exercises? What is the balance between independent group work and shared group work? It's important to think about this because group work and connecting with others, discussing things has costs. It's necessary, but it has costs. So achieving the right balance is absolutely key. Um, Northern bias. Uh, what I mean here is, is in some cases, you have a situation where the, 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 the partnership is very much led by a, a Northern institution. It's often the case. Uh, and more often than not, you have a situation where the research is defined by research interests in the North. By North, I mean the developed world, rich countries. Even though a lot of the research is conducted in southern countries, there is growing awareness of this, but it's it's still it's still an issue. And in Sentinel, there was recognition that the project really tried to foster co leadership um, and co creation, but a lot of the research was still seen as reflecting the the interests of UK researchers, um, even though the work was conducted in and targeted policy in in the African countries. Um, so we can talk more a bit about that afterwards. Uh, institutional and organizational constraints. So I've mentioned time constraints. You know, researchers, particularly seniors researchers, are very difficult. Uh, excuse me, very um, very time constrained. So what is difficult is engaging. Uh, you know, in in these iterative discussions, they have transaction costs. Um, and um, and we can also discuss this more later. Uh, clashing incentive structures, as I've mentioned, so you have individuals from different organizations and different sectors, and they can be subject to different incentive structures. Um, yeah, so for instance, in terms of outputs, IID has a strong focus on policy briefs, but in, 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 in academic organizations, the, the, the priority will be peer-reviewed publications, and both can work together, of course one can lead to another, but, but, but there, there can be a, a challenge in, in, in managing time for both. Um, okay, so, so now I'll, uh, I'll give you some key insights and I'll try to speed up a bit. Um, 
so first it's key to acknowledge that that interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary work can really shift away from disciplinary ways of working. They're complex, uncertain, they entail additional costs, um, and importantly, they require an open-minded, uh, reflexive and collaborative approach that does as much justice to the process of collaboration as the purpose. So there's a lot of focus on outputs when you engage in projects, you know, what is the output? Uh, you know, uh, and that's really important and people need to agree on what the outputs are. But if, but a lot of times not enough attention is paid to the actual process and it's a social process and it's about people working with people and, and really understanding that is, 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 lit is essential to delivering on those outputs. Um, so which competencies you need depends on your role. I'll, I'll mention some cross-cutting ones. Uh, the first one, I think this is obvious, it's the willingness to embrace, well, it might not be obvious actually, the willingness to embrace complexity and uncertainty, different ways of knowing, stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, time, we work under time pressure, but actually budgeting enough time is really essential for these processes, for dialogues, for, for participatory processes and trust building. Proactivity, as I mentioned, is key. Um, because these are diverse teams, it's absolutely essential to understand your partners. Like for instance, what is it that motivates them? What is it that they are concerned about? Um, what constraints do they work under? How do they approach their research? When we work in disciplines, we have assumptions about what people know and how they work. When you work across disciplines, you cannot hold those assumptions. And even less so if you work with policymakers or, or practitioners, you have to really unlearn what you know and learn by talking to others. Um, so yeah, um, systems thinking skills, I think that's really important. So that's the seeing the big picture stuff, uh, like how do different research components link up and reflexivity, meaning taking a step back, reflecting on your assumptions, listening to others, and yes, focusing on the process. So I'm just speeding up a bit here. Um, leadership, absolutely key to instill a sense of mission and pride. I think that's clear. Orchestrating expertise and relationships in a way that supports the achievement of goals. Um, but leadership isn't just about having one leader. It's about diffused leadership uh, throughout the various uh, stages of the project. Sometimes one team might come forward at, at one stage in the process and exert leadership because they, they hold the skills for that process, for instance then another might, might jump in. Um, collaboration, this is really important. Uh, no one a discipline or stakeholder should dominate the process. It should be genuinely collaborative from the onset. And this does not always happen. There are often power asymmetries. Um, there are many power asymmetries. Uh, sometimes this is discussed between different disciplines, but it's also the case between North and South collaborations. Um, so this is why funders talk a lot about equitable partnerships. Um, and, but often what you have is a situation like in Sentinel where the, 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 the lead accountable institution and the funders are Northern actors. And so that, that can challenge shared ownership uh, to start with. Um, the research agenda can be perceived as being driven by the North, even though the research is undertaken in the South. Uh, and that, uh, that, that imbalance can occur even if significant efforts are, um, are undertaken to, to co-develop and co-implement the research. Um, and importantly, um, I would say Sentinel was very UK heavy uh, in its structure. It had more organizations, even though there were three countries, Sub-Saharan African countries, overall there were more organizations in the United Kingdom and more researchers in the United Kingdom. And so, so that, that creates a sort of imbalance which challenges uh, shared ownership. Um, and uh, I'll mention also that delivering on the promise of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary research partnerships uh, is not just about research expertise. So putting together a bunch of disciplinary experts, no matter how stellar their research is in a room will not deliver on that process. 
Um, so I, that's one, I think this might be obvious to some of us, but I mean, it's quite clear in Sentinel and, and, and through adaptive management, we overcame some of that, but research teams need partners with process-based skills. So individuals who can mediate discussions or support relationship building, uh, they need individuals who can bridge and coordinate research processes. Um, so to give you a very specific example in Sentinel, there was a need to link quantitative biodiversity and land use modeling uh, with qualitative scenario analysis. So the qualitative part was where you engage stakeholders to, 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 to devise potential stories of the future, right? And that the idea is then to merge that with quantitative modeling. I won't go into the process, nor do I fully understand it, but the point is that there needs to be somebody who understands both sides in order to bridge the process. And not, that's a tough skill. Not everybody has that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip over a few things now. Shared ownership is really important because this, this is a cooperative and a team endeavor. And lastly, trust and confidence. And trust and confidence really take time to, to build and repeated interactions. Um, in terms of the process, face-to-face -face dialogue is absolutely key. Obviously, with COVID, that is challenged, but we have Zoom. Uh, we can talk a bit more about that afterwards. Um, but yes, face-to-face -face dialogue, building trust between unfamiliar actors, um, and the amount, timing, and types of interactions really influence the quality of the, uh, the co-production processes between partners. And really it's, we hear this a lot, you know, the, the, the water cooler talk, the coffee or tea talk, whatever, uh, the value of informal interactions can't be understood, uh, understated, excuse me. Um, and yes, when you have a project across different geographies, the greater the, the distance between people, the greater the need to think this through carefully uh, and establish mechanisms to bring people together. So for instance, um, <clears throat> researcher secondments is an important process. And uh, yeah, um, I think advances in, in, in technologies like Zoom really can help build a, a hybrid approach to this, both a, like a mix of in-person and, and remote interactions. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention this again, because teams are diverse, it takes time to unpack the expectations and develop a shared understanding. And it's, it's, it's important not to sort of force co-creation and rush into it and to plan it out out of fear that maybe people will not come together and, and work together, right? Uh, there needs to be time to let people just to get to know each other and, and to talk to each other informally and you know organize a workshop with good food and, and have people talk to each other. Um, and, and it's very likely that there are different expectations around objectives and outputs between partners. Um, uh, and I, as I mentioned, this is largely because, you know, there are different incentive structures that people work under. So let's, let's recognize this, this potential tension and let's, let's uh, manage it. And facilitation, I've mentioned this, I think, that's really important to manage social dynamics and to come together around a shared vision uh, or problem framing and to, to, you know, to potentially overcome conflicts, which will occur at some point. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I've written way too much. Um, and lastly, I'll mention that, that focusing on the process of research is, is, is really important for adaptive management for these long projects. Uh, and to build capacity and, and, and to really learn from the process. And, and um, a slight anecdote, the interviews I did were to, yeah, to, to learn from the project and the experience of the participants. But one thing that came out was a lot of people said that um, the interviews were unexpected to them. They felt they had great value and one of the ways in which they had value was that they fostered uh, reflection. So basically just me talking to people made them think about their, their position in the project, their objectives, um, and, and it actually, in some cases, changed their, their sort of approach. Um, I'll mention a few points about internal uh, communication now, and, and then I'm done. 
Um, but internal communication is really important. So we often talk about communication in terms of the translation of research. Um, but, but the internal process between partners is also important. Um, it's critically important, in fact. Um, and I think we are recognizing this now, but just relying on, on, on email is, 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 is not that effective. Um, when working with partners in, in different countries, it's important to think about uh, other platforms, even phone calls, just, you know, I, I for instance, one, uh, I work very closely on this project with Adrian Martin at Greenwich. And for us, the best way to communicate is just to pick up the phone and, and, and talk. Um, and find find a platform that gets buy-in from the team. So so we had a we had SharePoint because uh, I think IID had a contract with Microsoft. Uh, but SharePoint was often highlighted as more cumbersome than useful. Uh, and so Slack uh, Slack was seen as a better tool. Um, but we also see that there are, you know people use so many different platforms and tools that there's like uh, you know they they they're sometimes overloaded. So I personally find it tough to keep track of all the Slack groups I'm in. Um, and yeah, incorporate face-to-face -face, uh, discussions like, through the coffee break, for instance, and could really consider the facilitation for discussions and keep, I think this is clear, but you'd be surprised how often it doesn't happen. Keep emails short, succinct, and straight to the point. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think this is it. Yeah, consider segments. So we did not, um, because of COVID in Sanson, we couldn't do the, the segments that were planned. Um, these researcher exchanges, I think a few did take place, but um, but not to the extent that we hope. But they're really important to build relationships uh, and promote um, uh, knowledge and expertise transfer. So I hope that was all clear, um, and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone, and also thank our. I want to thank our uh, partners at RU Forum in Uganda, um, and uh, and uh, David Akepu and Anthony Agiru, who are also working on on capacity strengthening, focusing on on a cohort of, of PhD students in in Africa. So thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Alex. That was super interesting. What what a whirlwind tour you've given us. That I think these are the challenges that so many of us are facing and there's some great questions in the chat which we can come to in a second but one of the ones actually I was thinking of and, and Cecile also was that um, with all these mo moving parts how how do you keep track of of all these moving parts do you have an online management system or, or how how is that managed because everybody needs to input right so how do you manage that um how does the project if i understood your correction correctly the answer is there is a fantastic coordinator and manager and um so i think you mean yeah so for instance how did the, the various comp project components link up right yeah um and so I, I i didn't mention this explicitly but but we've drawn um we've used a variety of different tools like for instance a process tracker uh, which is uh, a tool we co-developed led by the coordinator that allows each team to update on their progress each month. Um, so the project has different work packages and every month we fill out, it takes literally two minutes um, We because we do it regularly. Every team fills out what they're doing and then that's compiled by the coordinator, um, the manager um, and um, uh, Beth Down, who, who works at, at IID uh, closely with, with the PI, uh, Barbara Adolf, um, and that's shared with everyone. And, and then, um, uh, so once it's compiled, it's shared with everyone and we discuss it. So there are a variety of tools. I think an, a, a one we didn't use enough of, um, we did do a who's who, which is sort of like a, a summary of, of who who is doing what and what the roles are. But I think we can you can make that in a much more interactive way through say an organogram. So like a map of the project and the different partners and disciplines and who's working where, uh, what do they know? How does their work link to, to the, you know, uh, to the work of others? Um, I think we didn't explore that enough, um, but but that's, that's definitely something to consider doing. Um, but largely it's down to this internal communication stuff is really largely down to the coordinator 
and a learning lesson. And this is the funders have, have seen this, um, but it's it's the budget, a coordinator or a manager that is not the PI and that has 100% of their time dedicated to this process. And that person needs to have, um, needs their, their work needs to be seen as core to the success of the team. Um, there should be sorts of hierarchies developing, you know, oh, my role is more important than yours. No, I mean, they're all important. So it's key to have a, somebody who, who really sort of acts it as this internal mediator, uh, working with other facilitators who might play a more active role in managing discussions um, uh, and helping come to shared understanding. Yeah, I think that's so important to have that one person dedicated. Um, would, please do feel free to put your cameras on so we can see, um, see all these faces that are here today. And if anyone has a question, please just pop your hand up and we can get you to ask it directly to Alex. Um, while, oh, Mark, Mark, thank you, Mark. I know you've got a question to Alex, haven't you? Um, loads of questions. I was, thanks very much for that. It's really, um, it's really nice to see it kind of all these issues that I think many of us are familiar with kind of brought together um, in this kind of more systematic and kind of organized way. Um, I was, my kind of question was uh, basically like, is there a paper coming on this um, or like a kind of a document that we can kind of draw on to, to share with other researchers to draw on to help us in our kind of ongoing work? Um, yeah. Yes, yes, there is. And uh, the first output, um is going to come soon and that's um a guidance brief so this workshop i'm we're running on monday will feed into that um ide ideally i would have liked to have that done before but um yeah but but we uh, we ran into some delays so 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 what that the, the guidance brief will come after that and and with adrian martin in greenwich we're also going to work on 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 a manuscript uh, to unpack that but I still have to do a lot of analysis. Um, Great, thanks very much. I think Pam was asking a, a really interesting question. Did, did you want to put that directly to, to Alex, Pam? Yes, hi Alex. Thank you very much for that uh, talk and the challenges of uh, transdisciplinary working. Um, I was wondering about the challenge of language um so not just the fact you're dealing with people who have different native tongues but also when you're using particular terms um people from different countries and different disciplines often use the same term but in incredibly different ways um, and in my experience of working in sort of such projects which is relatively limited but actually language around usage of terms was probably the biggest challenge and it had to be sorted out at the beginning. Otherwise, you got into some quite interesting problems. Thanks. That is, um, yeah, I didn't um, unpack that uh, enough. It's critically important. Um, so, yeah, so people use the same word in different ways. So co-production is an example of that. We can talk about the co-production of ecosystem services, or, or we can talk about the co-production of knowledge, um, and they 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 mean slightly different things. Um, and I found out that the term analytical framework was used differently um, by different people on the project, uh, as another example. So jargon, disciplinary jargon, is definitely a barrier. There are there were many instances of of discussions where people thought they understood each other, but actually they didn't. And that is part of the reason why they felt the process was slow and cumbersome and, and not progressing. Um, so to start with um, discussions, 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 and the process of developing a conceptual framework should at least address part of those um, jargony issues. Um, so 
yeah, a conceptual framework. What what is the the the, the project trying to to address? Uh, what are the different facets involved? How do they come together? What is so? It's about coming up to a shared vision um, around the shared vision for the project, um, and um, so then the research questions that are developed can sit on top of this conceptual framework, um, and uh, and through the process of creating it, yes, uh, outlining differences in, in understanding between different terms. Um, I think that's that's really important. I don't know, Pam, you might have other lessons um, from your work, but. Um, no, I mean, I think for me, as I sort of said, I think when I was asking the question, it was a matter of identifying where those differences were very early on okay. in the process. Um, and for one project, we actually ended up with a glossary, an agreed glossary right. in terms. So we were, as it were singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, and that was interesting to develop. Um, it did slow things down, but I think we had greater understanding of each other and then worked together better having done that. Yeah, exactly. So, so when, when exactly. So this is what, why and partly why this, this way of working takes longer. I, um, in contrast to disciplinary work where, where people sort of like, you know, they 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 understand that the, the the same they have the same the same theoretical understanding, so to speak. This they use the terms in the same way. When working with different people, you 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 don't have that, so you need to spend time to develop that, and not rush through it. And yeah, I uh, I think the glossary approach was, was definitely used by some of the groups uh, in Sentinel. Oh uh, yeah, actually, to give a, a more um, I think a relevant example. So biodiversity. Biodiversity was interpreted differently by different groups within the project. So some came from a more agro-biodiversity background. Um, others were, you know, um, uh, focusing on 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 bias biodiversity at different scales. And so um, they 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 did a working paper basically to unpack what they meant by biodiversity and agro-biodiversity um, for the project, and that builds the the shared understanding that you referred to. Thanks. Um, Carlos, would you like to ask your question? Thank you very much, um, Carlin. And thank you very much for this um, presentation. I think it was brilliant, uh, the effort and the scale of it. Um, I was interested, Alexandra, whether you could mention the, how you address the methods in your methods of um, making transdisciplinary a research alive within the project um, when thinking about the um, power and decolonial issues, especially in an African context, um, because I'm thinking um, in the method is the tricky aspect of who you include and who you exclude in terms of A, disciplines, B, um, gender, uh, you know, where they come from the the uh, the people like what the ratio is um is it more from the global south etc i'd be interested to know how how you address that because that's a thorny issue it is a thorny issue and and well personally i i didn't actively intervene in that process in sentinel um but in the first the first way the project tackled that is is through this notion of, of um, participatory engagement to make sure that that the right people were involved at the right time in the right discussions um, and to if a process was seen to be dominated more by one group than another um, uh, that was that was brought to the forefront and 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 the issue was discussed openly uh, with partners to try to to remediate that, pro that, that that process so for instance modeling the, the expertise for modeling and this goes back to your point about you know the i guess the composition of the project but you have to understand where the expertise sits and how that can can perhaps reinforce these sorts of uh imbalances um the the, the reality is there are some capacity gaps that might be present in in the southern partner countries 
there are other capacity gaps present in northern countries as well. But 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 if a gap is 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 uh, manifests in 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 the south, so 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 for instance, um, a particular set of of modeling expertise, um, the process can quickly be led by by the northern actors, which in turn jeopardizes um, this notion of equitable partnership. So. Um, I think, yeah, to start, there, there was an attempt to, to also uh, sort of like co-create the, the, the proposal at the start, but I think one challenge was that that was brushed um, to, meet, to meet deadlines. And the, the reflection is that there was not enough time yeah, dedicated to it. And, uh, and that led to some lack of buy-in, I think, uh, down the line. Um, but through the course of the project and in, in discussions, the, uh, the project management that, that the project leads really try to foster a, a participatory approach um, and, and, and to make sure that, you know, um, the, the, the partners were aware of the various discussions happening. Um, but I don't think we had a specific method to be honest. And, uh, and I'd love to, uh, to learn more, more about that from, from your experience. But I think the first thing is, is to be aware of how these 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 issues, gender or uh, imbalances or or power asymmetries between the north and the south can um, can arise. Thank you. Okay, we've got a a, um, a question from Kim. She hasn't got some great uh, connectivity, so I'll ask it for her. Um, Alex, do you have any thoughts on how people? who can do the cross-disciplinary translation can have their skills better recognized. She says, lots of people are interested in this type of role, but there isn't a clear job description or, or career path and therefore doesn't carry appropriate recognition and skills data. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I think we need to keep repeating the, the, the message that it's important. Uh, we need to influence organizational structures. I think work is being done to that extent, even in Oxford, to emphasize the importance of particular roles, like for instance, coordination roles. Um, but it, there should be equal emphasis on, on, on um, people that can sort of help knowledge translation across disciplines. So, so I think that speaks to having a, a, a breadth of expertise. Um, I mean, the, the reality is, is notoriety is still very much dependent on, on having depth of expertise in one particular area. So some, some of the recommendation I've read is that you should also develop depth of expertise in the one field, you know, and, and then merge that with breadth of expertise and, and, and uh, you know, and, 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 and you can gain recognition in, in that way. Um, but the other point I'll mention is, is, and this is what we hope to do with um, with our outputs um, is to continue working with uh, liaising with funders to to emphasize these messages and to tell them you know okay so you'd like to fund these partnerships this is what you should look out for um, you need a, a uh, I'll call I'll call them a bridging people you need bridging people in the pro that that can be the researchers right so a given researcher may have enough breadth of expertise to understand how to bridge processes but but sometimes it, it's it's not the case. So the team needs to incorporate people like that. Um, and it doesn't have to be at the start necessarily, although I guess to draw up the conceptual framework, it's particularly useful. Um, but but they, that expertise can be brought in at, at various stages of the process. Um, so, but, but, but yeah, it's difficult to get recognition because incentive structures are still very much molded around disciplinary norms. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of us recognize this this challenge. Thanks. I think we've got a, a question from Katrina now. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to read it because it's a bit of a chunky question. <laughs> um, I've just uh, written here. Please, can you share some ideas or discuss more on how we can tackle potential biases that stem from the direction of the funding? Um, you mentioned a lot of this north to south. For example, how do we avoid prioritizing satisfying the interests of the principal funders in the North over the priorities of those locally at their research site? Um, to me, it feels like a lot of the capacity building is normally targeted at the Global South locations, 
What about capacity building in the north to support this co-production? Perhaps some unlearning exercises. Thanks. Great. Um, that's fantastic. I'll start with this last point you mentioned because that was core to our strategy. Uh, when I say we we did capacity strengthening, capacity building, I, I'm talking about. So we 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 targeted researchers in the UK and 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 in the partner countries um, to improve capacities that, that that we felt were really important for uh, interdisciplinary working and 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 research user engagement. Um, so so that was the project had that built in, if you will. Um, and I think I think uh, it's important to to consider uh, incorporating capacity strengthening for um, for these these um, uh, for inter and transdisciplinary working within you know departments um, and, and and organizations like Oxford. And, and, and some of that some of that exists already, uh, I think. Um, in terms of your other points, uh, other point, excuse me. Um, one thing I'll mention, um, although how feasible this is in practice is another another question, but is to see the extent to which the funder can appoint both. Um, but so, I mean, money is in the north, so the money is going to come from the north. But what can happen is, is a northern institution and the southern institution uh, can both be accountable to the funders. So I don't know how that might work in practice. Uh, funders seem to be more comfortable working with uh, northern partners, uh, potentially because of issues around organizational capacities. Um, uh, but I think we need to explore that a little bit more because if if we had a the southern partner uh, directly accountable to the, the 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 funder that 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 I think would create a more equitable partnership. Um, in in order to ensure that 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 research needs the the research needs are really um, you know the needs of shaped around the needs of, of local communities and that's really important for for you know um, for the effectiveness of um, the extent to which the research is, is taken up and useful. Um, I think it's about a, the process of, uh, of research user engagement. And, you know, so there might be a funding call. And of course, I think we, we should, we increasingly realize that we shouldn't just, you know, conceptualize the idea in a silo in, in our little offices, but instead should try to, um, um, to, 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 to go through a process of stakeholder engagement to, to learn what, what the, you know, the, the, the lived realities and these are on the ground. Now, a lot of times, you know, we, we think we, we know what the situation is, but, the, but that, that, that just may not be the case. Um, and to, to also to document that process. Now, the, the problem is, of course, uh, that process takes time. Uh, so, Again, this is where there's a clash between this way of working and and fun, uh, sort of like uh, incentive structures, you know. Um, but but somehow, if we can incorporate more time for that process, it it actually um, the rewards will come. Um, it'll increase the effectiveness of the process. It'll increase um, the sustainability of the project. Um, and and I think it's it's impact uh, down the line. Thank you, um, Alex. I've got a question from Nikita, which I thought was interesting. That's something I've come across as well. Uh, we all have um, participatory, participatory approach, co-creation workshops, etc., are all great. But the reality is, especially now with people joining on Zoom, is that people won't be fully present, like they're checking their phones and their emails and they need to arrive late or leave early. Do we just address this or accept it? Personally, in some of the projects I've been working on, we are finding the funding to hire in professional facilitators, which I think have really helped. Um, have you got any experience of, of that? Or what are Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do, we do. So... No, I don't think we should accept it. Um, 
that said, I mean, we, you know, let's take a step back and understand that people may have a need to do it. You know, everybody's working under different constraints and, you know, it's, it's, you know, if, if, you know, somebody is, for instance, you know, taking care of their kid at home, they they might not be fully present and we just have to, you know, accept that, right? They're making an effort to be as much as they, they're as much as they can, but, but yeah, we should address it. And the facilitator is absolutely essential. Um, that should not be taken lightly. And what, 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 um, what so, so for instance, uh, the, the workshop next Monday, uh, we have a facilitator from South Africa, uh, Dr. Dr. Anguenya, who will, uh, who has a lot of experience in facilitation, um, and we will lay some some ground rules uh, to to stimulate productive discussions. So, so yeah, I think that can be that can be dealt with, um, but um, but we also need to 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 be a little bit flexible, I think. Thanks, Alex. Changing times. Yeah, agreed. Mm. Um, Pam, did you want to come back with your one final thought on your terminologies? Um, well, well, unless there are other people who've got questions. I don't want to hold the questions, Carly. Go for it. I think we've got time for two more questions. OK. Um, so, yes, I just sort of agreed with what's going on in the chat with um, Mark and Jasper that terms can evolve during the course of the project, um, but suggest that these need to be documented so that you know, reports that are sort of written under one conception of a term can be properly um, understood. But also I do wonder the extent to which as we sort of refine terms, whether a lot of it's sort of academic navel gazing and are such changes actually of practical use and I'd be interested in people's experience of that. I think I've mostly been in sort of more academic projects, but I'm concerned that we get too hung up on definitions. Uh, that, yes, I, uh, that's a tough one. Um, because, you know, different terms do exist and, and definitions can help making sure that, that we have a shared understanding. But I agree with you in the sense that we shouldn't get caught up on, on you know, terms as long as we can ensure that we have, we, we agree on the substantive issues. So if, if, if we do know that we are communicating and talking about more or less the same thing, then it's okay. But uh, I'm not sure we always, yeah, that's always clear. Um, but I, 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 I would agree with you. It's important not to get stuck up on, on just arguing for the sake of arguing. Uh, it's about, you know, let, let, let's make sure we understand the same thing by this term. And, and, um, and I agree with it. And, 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 and I've seen those discussions take place where a partner from one discipline will just, you know, get a little agitated that, that a term isn't used properly, but, that, but that's because in the, this other uh, but this other team uses in different ways. I mean, for instance, like trade-offs, right? The word trade-off, yeah, the, it's economists will talk about trade-offs in one way. Ecologists will talk about trade-offs in a slightly different way, I think. And then people who work, you know, in who deal with political economy issues will talk about it in a different way. So they they will argue with each other saying that their perspective is more important or more valid, but the yeah, the reality is to have a productive discussion. The, the need is to have a productive discussion and to, to outline what the substantive issues are and, and not get in. Yeah, focus on, on, the, on, on the discussion as a means to an end, a collaborative end. Thank That's you. what I would say, yeah. I know Jasper, you've done quite a bit of work around this, this topic. I don't know if you wanted the, the final say before we close. I, I just put a comment in the chat, I think, uh, there's an interesting question around the purposes of co-production and it and I've said in the chat if the co-production is designed to affect external change by creating collectively derived facts from a group of people uh, then I think you know perhaps those changes in concepts over time are more academic concerns but uh, for some people co-production might be driven towards actually changing the way in which the people in the process think um, so it's not about 
uh, kind of creating a collective fact, but actually, you know, changing the ways in which people relate to one another and talk to one another and think about issues within the process itself. And I think in that case, understanding differences in concepts and how they change over time is actually really important. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, it, it is a very dynamic process and it's a fluid one. Um, I, I would very much agree with that uh, based on my experience. I think we better start wrapping up. We could talk about this all day long. It's something that, you know, these, these issues touch all of us with our work. Alex, I can speak for everyone. We're all really looking forward to these documents that you're going to produce. And if you can share them with us, we'd, we'd love to put them out on our Biodiversity Network website. If people would like to sign up to um, receive the newsletter, it's biodiversity at ouc.ox.act.uk. Um, and we can keep you appraised of when these things come out. But for now, thank you so much, Alex. Good luck. Hope the workshop next week goes well. And um, we'll be really looking forward to, to hearing more on this subject. Thank you, Carlin. And thank you, everyone, for listening in and for all of your questions. Thank you.